recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez, you're the CEO of AbbVie, which makes the cancer drug Imbruvica. Do you know what the annual price of Imbruvica was for a patient taking the standard three pills per day in 2013? $130,000. Okay, we had 99,766. What about today for those same three pills? Uh, I think it's 169,000. We have 181, but we can agree that there was a significant increase. Roughly in a matter of eight years, AbbVie more than doubled the price. Now, Mr. Gonzalez, how much money did AbbVie put directly into the research and development costs of Imbruvica before it hit the market in 2013? We acquired Imbruvica when it, uh, when it was launched, so it would have been the, uh, the company that we acquired. Which so, we acquired the we're cleaning my time. so AbbVie itself didn't spend any money to create Imbruvica. It was invented by a smaller company, Pharmacyclix, which you later acquired, correct? We paid $21 billion for the company, correct? It was expensive to acquire them. So you paid fair market value for pharmacyclics, but AbbVie then doubled the price, presumably justified by its $2.45 billion investment in R&D. Are there fewer side effects for patients now than there were in 2013? Well, we developed significant indications and expansions and other disease states. Are there for fewer side effects, sir? Uh, no, it has the same side effect profile. Okay. Mr. Gonzalez, do people need less of this medicine, Imbruvica, to treat lymphoma now? Uh, no. So AbbVie took zero risk to develop this drug. You bought it approved for the market, knowing it would be profitable. You hiked the price to pay for R&D, but you haven't made the drug any better, even as you doubled the cost. I wrote an entire report on what is essentially the Imbruvica story. Big Pharma gobbles up a small innovative company, does nothing to improve the drug, but jacks up the price. Now, you told us that you spent $2.54 billion for R&D, for Imbruvica, even though the drug didn't get any better. Really, it was all for these innovations and indications which are designed to keep competitors off the market and find new sales opportunities. So I wanna look at what other money AbbVie spends doing its business. You filed 165 patents for Imbruvica. You filed patents for Humira, other drugs to keep competitors off the market. How much did you spend on litigation and settlements from 2013 to 2018? Let me correct one thing that you, I think you just said. Uh, and it is not true that we didn't invest in additional indications and additional diseases. As an example, we received approval after the development work of uh, uh, graft versus host disease. Reclaiming, we also re reclaiming my time. Mr. Gonzalez, how much did you spend, did Abby spend on litigation and settlements from 2013 to 2018? Uh, I, I don't have that number off hand. We'll be happy to give it to you. Okay, $1.6 billion, $2.45 billion on R&D, $1.6 billion in litigation and settlements. What about marketing and advertising? How much does AbbVie spend on that? Uh, well, marketing and advertising, we spend about $4 billion a year. Yep, $4.71 billion. How about executive compensation, 2013 to 2018? 2013 to 2018, it's probably on average about $60 million a year. Try 334 on for size. Now, how much did Avi spend on stock buybacks and shareholders, stock, stock buybacks and dividends to enrich your shareholders from 2013 to 2018? Well, stock buybacks, if you actually look at just poor stock buybacks, it would be about $13 billion. Stock buybacks uh, and dividends is the question, sir. Uh, dividends that have to come back with that, a number for that over that period of time. Fifty billion dollars. So, Mr. Gonzalez, you're spending all this money to make sure you make money, rather than spending money to invest in, develop drugs, and help patients with affordable, life-saving drugs. You lie to patients when you charge them twice as much for an unimproved drug, and then you lie to policymakers when you tell us that R&D justifies those price increases. The big pharma fairy tale is one of groundbreaking R&D that justifies astronomical prices. 
But the farmer reality is that you spend most of your company's money making money for yourself and your shareholders. And the fact that you're not honest about this with patients and with policymakers, that you're feeding us lies, that we must pay astronomical prices to get innovative treatments is false. The American people, the patients, deserve so much better. I yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Laterna, is recognized for five minutes. Um, herself for five minutes of questioning. Um, Mr. Owens, who are the coal plants customers? Who are the coal plant customers? Uh, the energy from the coal plants benefit all Puerto Ricans. It's a part, it's integrated into our overall grid. It's a low cost okay. energy source. It's a reliable energy source, and the customers, the consumers of Puerto Rico benefit from a lower cost source of energy. They benefit okay. from a continuous source of energy. So, so all so, customers of Puerto Rico benefit. Okay, so the people of Puerto Rico broadly benefit from having access to um, having access to electricity. And it's a point Mr. Epstein has made that electricity is, is beneficial um, to people and to human life. Now, but I want to ask who just map this out a little bit because there's a lot of acronyms here. Who runs the plant that we're talking about today? This coal ash plant. Who runs it? Uh, this is owned by uh, AES. Uh, we have a contract with AES, uh, and we purchase the energy from that coal fire plant, and it feeds into our overall electricity grid. The plant is owned by AES. Okay. So they, they own it or they run it? I just want to be clear. They own the plant. AES owns the plant. Okay. Yes. And then who runs the grid? Today, uh, Luma runs the grid. Uh, prior to June the 1st, uh, PREPA ran the grid. Uh, but Luma has a 15-year operating and maintenance agreement in order to run the grid, in order to maintain the grid, and in order to enhance the grid. Okay, and then you are here today on behalf of PREPA, and what is your relationship with Luma? Uh, we are the owners of the grid. Luma is an operator of the grid. We need to make sure for the citizens of Puerto Rico that the grid is well maintained and the grid is well operated. So we have okay. oversight responsibilities. Wonderful, and then PREPA has to get major decisions approved by some other regulators, including um, FCOB, which is on the fiscal side, and then the energy regulator, um, PREB. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay, so here we're trying to map out kind of who, who's in charge here, all right? And you're here today on behalf of PREPA. So I, yes. I have a question. Can PREPA unilaterally close this coal ash plant without absolutely sign -off. absolutely thank you for the question absolutely not we are subject to the fomb we're subject to the preb we're subject to puerto rican law so we do not have the authority to shut down the plant absolutely okay. not. so you're saying prepa would have to go up up here and oh, so that's a bad arrow let me just fix that you would have to go up here and you would be subject to law if you decided to close the plant, could you simply direct Luma to shut it down? Uh, we can't shut down the plant. We can't direct Luma to do anything. We have to comply with the law. Okay. okay and, you, so, and those agencies, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. So no, Mr. Owens, this is very, very helpful. And I, I want the committee and the American people to understand that. You have kindly come before the committee and you are helping us understand who has responsibility for this coal ash plant. But I, so I just wanna make sure I understood what you said. Luma must be part of the decision to close this plant. Luma must comply with the integrated resource plan, which is approved by the PREP, which is our regulator. Luma cannot do anything on its own. Luma has to comply with the law. Okay, Luma's got so to Luma can't act alone. But I wanted to ask the reverse question. Yes. And one of these entities, including you, decide to shut this plant down with 
without Luma's participation or consent or pro being part of the process? Uh, Luma is a part of the process because they operate okay. the grid. So what I'm driving at here, Mr. Owens, is we need Luma to be here because they are part of the conversation. And as you know, we invited Luma to testify because they're part of this conversation. They are part of this process. They agreed to testify. And then at the 11th hour, Luma notified the committee that they would not be attending this hearing. And I, I just want to make sure the American people know what Luma said. Luma's senior director of government affairs said, quote, Luma just doesn't have a role that is relevant to this hearing, this hearing on this coal ash plant. But you have just explained to us, I believe correctly, that Luma must be part of this decision-making process. It was Luma's decision to commit to and then to withdraw from being present at this hearing. But it is my decision as chair of this subcommittee whether to pursue additional investigations. Luma may not be here today, but they must answer to the American people. It was a mistake for them not to participate, but I am going to give them ample opportunity to rectify that mistake and to come answer questions that this committee has about the coal ash plant and its effect on the well-being of the people of Puerto Rico. Um, with that, I yield back. I believe that concludes our hearing. There are no further witnesses at this time, no further members at this time. Um, and so before we do officially wrap up, I want to take the opportunity to invite our witnesses to share any additional thoughts on the issues that we have discussed today. We're going to go in the same order that we went in as people offered their testimony. So we'll start with Mr. Cologne. If there's anything else that you want to share that you think this committee or the American people need to know, you're welcome to share it at this time. Señor Colón, si hay algo que usted quiera compartir con nosotros que cree que el pueblo estadounidense o este comité debería saber, por favor, adelante. Lo, que, lo, lo, lo último pues que me gustaría este, a mí sería que, que ustedes pudieran este, analizar la situación que estamos viviendo nosotros los guayameses y parte acá y que pudieran hacer un análisis donde podemos determinar y que la fábrica se cierre y que nosotros podemos vivir, tener una calidad de vida mejor de la que tenemos ahora en el momento. I would like I would like you to analyze the situation that we're living here in Guayama, conduct the necessary tests and improve the life conditions. Thank you so much. Uh, we can't hear you. Um, oh, OK, great, great. Yeah, I, I want to say David thank o you for yeah, thank you for sharing that. And thank you to our interpreter um, for her work today and making sure that we can all understand and hear from all of our witnesses. Mr. Owens, any final remarks you'd like to make? Porter, are you here? If yeah. not, we'll wait. I'll, you know, I'll do my. I am here, sir, but Mr. Lowenthal, you can go first if you'd like. No, no, I'm going to wait. Uh, Representative Porter. Um, thank you. Uh, I have questions for uh, Mr. Short. What percentage of oil and gas leases on the outer continental shelf, which we commonly refer to as offshore leasing, are not producing oil and gas? Well, the numbers I, I provided for today's hearing were re really related to uh, overall, and it was basically two thirds of them, uh, the wells, looking at the wells. So the okay, so about two thirds of the wells are not producing oil. Um, they're not contributing to energy availability. They're not changing consumer prices. They're not creating energy independence. They're not producing, they're just sitting there. Now, when an oil company stops drilling offshore, do they immediately take away the platforms, the rigs, the wellheads, the artificial islands, the power cables, the pipelines, so that nobody can tell that the oil company was ever there? No, they do not. So I have a question. Does the lease require, these are federal leases. Um, this is our public land. Um, do the leases require offshore oil and gas companies to, when they're done drilling, to remove all equipment? And permanently plug these wells. So what the leases require is so, so when they cease production, they have basically one year Chain. to do that. Okay, so when they uh -oh. cease production, they're supposed to decommit. We call that decommissioning. 
where they remove, they're supposed to remove the equipment and permanently um, plug the wells. Um, the GAO has said there are about 38, there's about 38.2 billion in estimated decommissioning costs um, for the Gulf of Mexico alone. Do those companies have enough bonds and um, dedicated financial instruments set aside so that regardless of the up and down of the whatever their company's making, we can be sure that they'll be able to pay those decommissioning costs and taxpayers won't be on the hook? No, what, what our review of Bessie data shows is that they currently provide something less than one tenth and it could be uh, of the total uh, amount expected. Uh, cost. Okay, so I think what you said is about it's about 2.9, I like numbers. It's about 2.9 billion. Let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's round up to 3 billion, but there's about 38 billion of potential costs. So companies need, we're counting on these oil and gas companies to have the, the profits, the cash to make the investment to clean up when they're done. Have they been doing that? Well, typically what we will see, the, the answer is not really, typically what we'll see is well-to-do companies will transfer these assets into other entities uh, that have less financial means and wherewithal to actually conduct the cleanup. So they're moving, once they've taken the money and they've made the profit, then they're giving away, they're basically transferring away the unprofitable, difficult, expensive part of this, which is the decommissioning portion. And they're transferring that, are they transferring that to big, healthy companies? No, often they're transferring it to companies that didn't exist even uh, just you know, prior to the transfer. So they, you mean a shell yeah. company? Uh, yes. Like an entity created just for the purpose of pushing off the cost of doing business so that you don't have to pay it even though you got all the upside? Are you saying that this is what oil and gas companies do? Uh, we, we've seen this, yes. And how does the law facilitate this? Well, how does it facilitate it? Well, I, I suppose in a, on a couple of levels. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there's very little oversight of the transfer. Uh, and so there's very little restriction from a regulatory standpoint. This is true offshore and also onshore. So we see this behavior in both in both places. Um, and then secondary to that, uh, the, there is uh, actions that companies can take in bankruptcy that can effectively pass these liabilities on to taxpayers eventually. And so uh, some, some of it is to be able to use that in the event the new company goes bankrupt. So I was a bankruptcy law professor before I came to Congress and I taught business law. And a lot of these, these laws about allowing companies to, to create sub entities, to sell assets, to file bankruptcy when they're in financial trouble, they exist for really good reasons, but they also can be abused. And the entire and we and the result of that is we, the taxpayers, having given oil and gas companies our oceans, our public lands, our wildlife, our our nature, our planet to make profit, end up on the hook if they take advantage of this scheme of this legal scheme and these you know transfers, um, and then they put us on the hook for that. Why shouldn't we have higher bonds? and make sure that no taxpayer is on the hook for cleaning up a mess that another company profited from making. No, 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 certainly no private actor would do what the federal government does, which is not have a security for these risks. So, <laughs> so taxpayers are being asked to take on risks that private companies wouldn't. We're giving the oil and gas companies a bargain deal here in terms of offshore liability, because we're not, we're not asking them to indemnify, to protect us, to have bonds, to make sure we're, we're saying, take our public land, take our water, in this case, drill. And if at the end you want to hand back the mess to us, that's okay. That's currently what the government's doing. That's effectively what is happening, yes. Well, that is not acceptable to me. I don't think it should be acceptable to anyone on this committee, regardless of party. If there's going to be offshore drilling, and there currently is, then you know, one of my favorite phrases is you buy the ticket, you take the ride. You buy the ticket, you lease, you take on the oil and gas company lease, then you take the ride, and that includes paying for the full cost of decommissioning. And that's exactly what I think the federal government ought to be requiring of oil and gas companies is protecting taxpayers when they want to benefit from the taxpayer's property. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I yield back. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Scope, um, do you believe all Black Lives Matter? Of course I do. Um, you have written that widespread abortion in the Black population has become an acceptable, quotes, acceptable form of racism in the United States today. You wrote clearly, this quote, clearly abortion has disproportionately affected the Black community, leading to a decrease in their population numbers, as well as many adverse consequences to women and children. Many of the pathologies, your word, affecting the Black community can be at least partially attributed to the breakdown in families and the absence of paternal involvement facilitated by abortion. Mental health complications in Black women leading to deaths of despair can be caused by abortion. Could you explain to me what your expertise and familiarity is with Black families? Well, I have a, um, a niece and a nephew that are both Black. Wonderful. Um, Thank you very much, Dr. Scope. Well, um, turning now to Professor Murray, would, how would you respond to this argument? So thank you so much for the question. The purported links between abortion and the eugenics movement is a subject of my own scholarship. I recently published a paper in the Harvard Law Review outlining the ways in which this narrative of abortion as eugenics is being used to advance race-based grounds for overruling Roe versus Wade. And the increased interest in this narrative can be traced to Justice Clarence Thomas's 2019 concurrence in Box versus Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky. There, Justice Thomas attempted to graft abortion to the history of the eugenics movement in the United States. Unfortunately, the history upon which he relied to do so was woefully incomplete. Justice Thomas was correct to note that in the 1920s and 1930s, the United States was in the grips of eugenics fervor and its concomitant interests in racial purity and white supremacy. However, in advancing those interests in racial purity, the eugenicists did not rely on abortion. Rather, their efforts were channeled into bans on interracial marriage, immigration laws that kept certain ethnic minorities out of this country, and most importantly for our purposes, forcible and coercive sterilization of those with so-called weak or deleterious genes. These sterilization laws were later repurposed and redirected in the 1960s toward poor women who were receiving public assistance. So this is all to say that sterilization rather than abortion was the eugenicist's preferred means of reproductive control. And to the extent that abortion figured into this eugenic fervor at all, it was in the effort to compel native-born white women to reproduce in greater numbers. In the period following the Civil War, there was considerable anxiety about the changing demographic character of this country. White middle-class women were using contraception and abortion to limit their families to manageable sizes, while immigrant women were having babies in record numbers. Fearing the replacement of native-born whites by immigrants, policymakers sought to reverse the trend among white women by enacting criminal bans on abortion throughout this country. And then finally, I will just note that some of the members of this committee are among the 14 House Republicans who voted against making Juneteenth a federal holiday. When you fail to take even this modest step to acknowledge the Black experience in this country, it is very difficult to take seriously your claims that your support of flagrantly unconstitutional abortion restrictions are animated by concern for black women and our children. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon, is recognized for five minutes. <laughs> 